And let me show my screen in here as well. Make sure this is showing. Okay. All right, folks, if you cannot see my screen, let me know. Uh, currently, I'm just showing, uh, it's a SharePoint Online site over here. I'm gonna switch to PowerPoint. So once again, welcome. Welcome to the webinar. Today's webcast is on SharePoint 2016, but not just regular SharePoint 2016 and features and how cool it is and all that stuff. It's what's in it for you. That's what Bill is going to be talking about, right? Bill, who's a senior technical product manager at Microsoft and is uh, wearing a lot of hats. Bill and I were just talking earlier and he's doing security compliance, administration. There's just so much stuff that you're doing, Bill. I don't know how you're doing it. Uh, I, I, I remember being in a session with Bill a few years back and we're just going back and forth talking about the different features uh, that's going to be going into SharePoint 2016. And it's a pretty big debate many times as to what, should make sense uh, for the customers, what makes sense, of course, with the product and the roadmap of where it needs to go. There's a lot of stuff that goes in into making those decisions. So uh, kudos to, uh, to uh, you know, to you, <laughs> uh, Bill, and to your team actually to making that hard decisions. So today, uh, he'll be talking about that, taking your questions as well. The questions and answer panel that you just uh, nicely put in your cities and your countries in there, the same place you want to put in your questions as well. I'll try to get to them as I can. If I know the answers, if I want to uh, stage them, and I'll go ahead and pitch it to Bill to in between the webinar or at the end of the webinar, whatever makes sense at that time. By the way, I didn't introduce myself well. My name is Asaf Ramani. I've been a SharePoint MVP for, wow, a decade now. Actually, 2007 is when I first became a SharePoint MVP. And I'm from Visual SP. Uh, here's our uh, Twitter tags, both of us, if you need it, William Bear and Asif Ramani for myself. I'm going to do one more thing before I jump into talking about SharePoint 2016. Something I was talking to Bill about earlier as well is, you know, product could be really good, which is wonderful, but you need to get people to use it, and that's the hardest part sometimes. How do you get people to actually utilize the platform, the product, the way you need it to? And uh, if you guys online right now are interested uh, understanding how you can help with adoption, help with end user training, help with also uh, providing the policies and governance that you have in place directly to your users when they need it, where they need it, directly in context. There's a couple of different things that we help with uh, visual S at Visual SP. One is this uh, help tab and also the inline help that you see right here. And all this is is when you click on something here, so let me click on check out a page, for example. Someone's trying to understand, how do I check out a page? It, a video comes up directly in context to help them with it. Or page quick reference. And a quick reference sheet comes up that they can print out or put on a different screen to help them with this as well. Uh, in addition to this delivery mechanism, which is directly on the ribbon, uh, and uh, the inline help icons, as I mentioned over here, there's also the other delivery mechanism, which is which I was just showing on the other screen here, which is through the Help tab on the right. And this uh, can appear, of course, on any page as well. This also provides in-context video. So contextually, wherever the person is, whether the document library or announcement list, wherever they are, they get help as they need it, where they need it. I'll go ahead and click on, for example, the Team Site homepage quick reference. So this is quick reference for that. Uh, one other thing that I was just talking about before we started this thing, let me show this as well, and then we'll get started, it, are the walkthroughs functionality. Uh, and this I'm showing SharePoint Online with, you know, having walkthroughs like this uh, to help people walk through the actual interface. They can say, all right, well, here's how you share your site. And you, if they click on show me how, it will show them how to set up the security for the site, site administration. Yeah, uh, having these kind of walkthroughs, short videos, annotated screenshots, or other things which really help onboard the users, uh, helping them with policies of what you want them to do and what you don't want them to do, I believe is pretty helpful. Uh, there's going to be a survey at the end which talks about the product, and if you want any more information on it, let us know. I'm going to stop here with this thing, uh, let you get back now to the SharePoint 2016 webcast, which we're all here for. So as I said, I think Bill is one of the best people in the world to talk about this thing. So thank you very much, Bill, for joining us and uh, starting and talking about it. So it's all yours.
Absolutely. Thank you uh, very much. And really cool demos. Um, you know, I, I can't stress the importance of, of help and particularly contextual help when it comes to to using SharePoint because, uh, you know, definitely in product help has a ton of benefit for your information worker who's just trying to figure out how to use the product and, you know, it, it helps abstract, you know, a lot of the, the topics that they would normally be exposed to through TechNet or MSDN that, mm -hmm. that you know, generally aren't IW centric. So it's really a great opportunity to, uh, to help, you know, users understand how to leverage the product in the best possible way, which is always great for us because if you're not, if you don't know how to use it, in all likelihood you're not using it. You definitely <laughs> exactly. People to use SharePoint. Exactly. You don't want it to become shelfware. It's SharePoint, not ShelfPoint. <laughs> exactly. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, SharePoint Server 2016 and, and largely focus the conversation on the why SharePoint Server 2016 and what's in it for you. At the same time, we'll also talk about some of the features and capabilities and some of the guiding principles for SharePoint Server 2016. So once you have that foundational understanding of, of our view of SharePoint 2016, it'll help you understand where you can find the value in the product itself. And we'll demonstrate a couple of things along the way and keep the conversation relatively dynamic so you're not inundated with slides over the course of the next hour. So I'm Bill Baer. I'm a product manager in our SharePoint product group. I focus on a number of different areas of the product, both cloud and on-premises. Uh, obviously, our server product, our on-premises product, hybrid and migration are core to my day-to-day -day responsibilities to also include security, compliance, and administration, largely with that focus being on Office 365. And then here and there, I focus on the extensibility space, depending on where we're at in the product lifecycle and what's going on at that particular point in time. So SharePoint Framework was something that I worked on for about nine months um, before transitioning that off over the course of the last few months. Um, I was previously at Hewlett Packard for a long amount of time until I got invited to work on this thing called SharePoint at Microsoft. So, you know, here I am, you know, almost a decade and a half later, still with the product, and it's been an exciting time over the course of the last 18 months, both for cloud and on-premises. So here there's a number of different ways you can connect with me, follow me on my blog, um, or on LinkedIn. I won't spend a whole bunch of time on introduction, what I really want to talk about first is an overview of what 2016 is, what it means to us, how we saw the product, and some of our guiding development principles. So we released to web SharePoint 2016 in the second quarter of calendar year 2016. So you might remember in March, we RTM SharePoint 2016, and then at our May 4th event, we announced general availability of SharePoint Server 2016. So we're approaching now a year in market for this version of our on-premises product. When we designed SharePoint 2016, we did a number of things fundamentally different than we did with previous releases of SharePoint. If you think of SharePoint in the past, we used to build SharePoint from the ground up. So effectively, building SharePoint as an on-premises product delivering it to our customers, and delivering it to our own cloud to facilitate SharePoint Online. With SharePoint 2016, we made a number of decisions to drive greater engineering efficiency, while at the same time making it more capable to deliver cloud accrued innovation back to our customers. So the first decision that we made from a product design perspective is we looked at SharePoint and decided to build it from the cloud down. And what that means is this is the first time from a product history perspective that we actually delivered our on-premises product from our cloud code base. In the past, we were doing one thing in two different ways. We were building an on-premises product while at the same time building a cloud product, the product that you're probably familiar with is SharePoint Online. What we decided to do with SharePoint 2016 is converge those code bases so we could ship both our cloud and our on-premises product from a unified code base. That allows us to be more efficient from an engineering perspective, but it also means that we're able to accrue cloud innovation at a much more rapid cadence back to this server release. When we first released SharePoint 2016, we focused on three core areas of innovation, or what we called our value pillars. 
You're probably familiar with those from some of our marketing collateral as we led up to the 2016 launch and even afterwards as being a cloud-inspired infrastructure, delivering modern user experiences, and then compliance, what we called people-centric compliance. Those were our three guiding principles as we designed the product. Because we shipped SharePoint 2016 from our cloud code base, we natively accrued a set of cloud innovation back to the server by default. So at first glance, when you look at SharePoint 2016, the overall user experience didn't fundamentally differentiate itself that much from SharePoint Server 2013. The reason is, is because if you looked at SharePoint Online prior to our May 4th event of this prior year, SharePoint Online looked a lot like SharePoint Server 2013. So naturally, because we have a converged code base and we derived our product from the cloud, it looks very similar to what the cloud did, effectively SharePoint Server 2013. However, we did cherry pick specific capability from SharePoint Online to bring back to the server release natively at RTM in March of 2016. Some of those include the app launcher that you're probably familiar with in Office 365 on the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, most people affectionately refer to that as the waffle. We also introduced large file support, so support for files beyond 2 gigabytes up to 10 gigabytes. So we introduced that threshold, which was a fundamental change. It seems relatively benign when you talk about it, but at the same time, one of the top requests that we've received over the years of working on SharePoint was increase the support for larger file sizes. In addition to that, we also introduced a new simple sharing user experience. We introduced site folders, some durable links, some simple controls, uh, fast site creation, a new set of APIs, the touch web UX that you're probably familiar with from OneDrive for Business. We also introduced ODF support in libraries, a number of search improvements, as well as some, some compliance tools. And that really captured the three value pillars that we focused on as we designed the product. So what I'm going to do here real quick is bear with me because I'm going to switch screens to just give you a, a brief introduction to some of these capabilities. So here we are on a SharePoint Server 2016 site. Looks just like it did at RTM. There's been no investment in, in UX on this particular site. So this is native out-of-the-box SharePoint functionality. And some of the things that you can see here is the app launcher. And this is a great example of crowd, or the simple controls menu. And this is a great example of cloud accrued functionality. So if you look here at the top of the document library, one of the things that we've done is we've abstracted the ribbon. What we found from an A-B testing perspective inside of Office 365 is that users were more likely to collaborate when we abstracted that ribbon. So effectively, that means they spent more time uploading documents, sharing documents, and collaborating on documents when we abstracted the ribbon in favor of the simple controls. And we learned a lot of that through A-B testing. And that's really one of the things from a SharePoint 2016 perspective that you don't see in code. So if you think about what we talked about a few minutes ago, this concept of being a converged code base, because it's a converged code base, one of the things that we do a lot of in Office 365 is A-B testing and collecting telemetry. It helps us better understand how our customers use our product, and then we can optimize the experiences for those use case scenarios. And this is a great example of one of those benefits that you get that's not native code, but really based on how people use the product. So the simple controls menu is a great example of one of those capabilities. So here on my document library itself, you can see my simple controls menu. It's basically a very simple control surface that rides right above the document library itself. If I select a document, such as the SharePoint Server 2016 data sheet, I have all of the common controls I would need to manipulate this document or work on this document with other users right at my fingertips. So if I wanted to share this document, I could very quickly share the document with Dan, for example, click the share button, and the document shared. So I'm abstracting the ribbon. For more advanced functionality, I can definitely still do that, and I can work through that through the More menu. So that's just one example of what came from the cloud and landed in the server. Also the app launcher. So if I want to quickly navigate uh, workloads delivered by SharePoint, I can do so in a very familiar way. 
So I've got my news feed, OneDrive, sites, and then I've got a custom tile we'll talk about momentarily. In addition to that, we also introduced a compliance policy center, which is new to SharePoint Server 2016. The compliance policy center enables you to create deletion policies, data loss prevention policies, create in-place hold policies. So very familiar to the experience that exists in SharePoint Online or in Office 365. So I can navigate back to sites, again, through the app launcher or through Global Nav <laughs> and get right back to where I was. In addition to that, the eDiscovery Center, we made some updates there. So we carried the sensitive information types investment from Office 365 back to SharePoint Server itself. So I can go into my DLP queries. I've already got one set up as US financial data. I can click on that. And as you can see, here's sensitive type. And this is that sensitive information type concept I talked about. So really what we did in this particular case is a sensitive information type, again, is abstraction of, of a complex algorithm. And in this particular case, a sensitive information type identifies a set of content, performs a proximity scan, does some complex pattern matching, and then also uses corroborating evidence to try to determine whether or not content fits the need of that particular policy or matches the needs of that particular policy. So very easily, if I wanted to search for credit card numbers, I could just use the sensitive type credit card number, and then I could pipe in five. And what five means in this particular example is only trigger my query or result, uh, a result of my query in the event that, there, that the content itself contains five or more instances of this particular sensitive type. And then I can pair sensitive types as well. So I can use and or and pair sensitive types. I can look for routing numbers, for example, if it's a checking account. So I can just run a quick search and I get my query statistics. I can expand upon that and I can see what was detected. In this case, I have credit card number <coughs> or routing number, and up here I have credit card number. So I can see that there was an actual document that met the conditions of the policy, and here's the document itself. If I wanted to see the document, I could navigate directly to its library or click here. In this particular case, what I'll do is I'll navigate directly to where that document is stored. It's in my sample documents folder, and the other thing that you see is this document has this warning icon next to it. By hovering over the warning icon, it tells me that access to the information is blocked because it conflicts with an organizational policy. I can click on that to get a policy tip, and the policy tip expands upon what that document contained that met that particular criteria of that DLP policy. So I can either resolve it as the owner, or I can just close that and open it up. In my case, I can open it because I own the document. So now I can see all of these different credit card numbers that match the criteria specified <coughs> as part of that DLP query. Now if we move backwards a little bit and just go back to where we were, where did all of that come from? So where that all came from is that DLP query was based on a sensitive information type. Sensitive information types can be used outside of DLP as well. So in this particular case, I can go back to my Compliance Policy Center and as you can see, I have a U.S. financial data policy that uses a sensitive information type. And that's where the policy tips and everything else came from. So if I wanted to, I could go to DLP Policy Management, create a new item, and choose a pre-existing sensitive information type and create a DLP policy and then subsequently assign that policy to one or more site collections and enforce that policy. So one of the other things that's great about 2016 is you're getting a lot of native capability from Office 365 that's baked directly into the server itself, allowing you to take advantage of those cloud capabilities on premises. We also brought in the mobile view. So this is the mobile view you're probably familiar with from SharePoint Online or OneDrive for Business, and we made it applicable to sites. So now I have a mobile view available to me <coughs> as well, and I can quickly move in and out of that mobile view and get back to PC. And then lastly, you can do creative little things like creating custom errors. So if I click on custom error here, I've got a nice little custom error message that as opposed to presenting me with a correlation ID, gives the IW some additional information on what steps to take. So you can very simply demonstrate this on your own by simply appending error.aspx with error text and then whatever your error text may be. And now I can navigate directly back to my site. So I'm just going to move back to the slides real quick because that was just a quick demonstration of 
some of the capabilities that were natively accrued from SharePoint Online and Office 365 directly back to the server as a result of our converged code base. So now moving on, let's talk about another thing that we're doing that SharePoint Server 2016 allowed us to do, and that's the concept of a feature pack. And effectively what a feature pack is, is a feature pack in itself isn't representative of some piece of code that we're delivering to you. And by that what I mean is that there's nowhere you can go today to download and install a feature pack. It's not an executable, it's not an installer package. What a feature pack refers to is a moment in time at which we light up cloud features for our on-premises customers. Many of you are probably using Office 365 today. Many of you may have first release turned on for either select users or for your organization. And the way that features get lit up in Office 365 is they pass through a number of rings of release, through a set of rings internally, our first release ring, and then ultimately our production ring when everybody gets to see a feature. With feature packs, we can effectively do the same thing for our on-premises customers. The way that we do it, though, is instead of through rings of release, we do it through our public updates. Our public updates are delivered on a monthly cadence. So every month when you download a public update, there's actually features that are from based on cloud innovation included in those monthly updates. So starting from the day we released 2016 to the day we released our first public update, there are already cloud features from Feature Pack 1 being deployed to on-premises. The, the reason is, is because we can dark deploy these features to you over the course of time, and when they become production ready, that becomes our Feature Pack moment. In this particular case, our Feature Pack moment was the November PU. So up until November, we were dark deploying features through our public updates and then lighting them up for you at a specified moment in time through our November public update. What that allows us to do is more rapidly bring innovation back to our customers of on-premises. We recognized a problem from SharePoint 2013 and earlier versions of SharePoint in that the cloud was always going to move faster than our on-premises release. So what we wanted to do was recognizing that problem, we wanted to reduce the amount of incremental differentiation between SharePoint Online and SharePoint Server 2016. The reason we're able to do this is because we're coming from a converged code base. So we can invest in the on-premises server from a technology perspective in many of the same ways that we can invest in SharePoint Online. So we recognize that we had an opportunity from that converged code base to release cloud features and capabilities on an accelerated cadence. Previously, you had to rely on one of two things in order to get new capability on premises, which was one, our major server release, which was on a two to three year cadence, or number two, service packs, which were on an annual cadence uh, for most, for all intents and purposes. Every year we would release a service pack. With that said, because we've shifted to public updates as being our driving force between for how we update the server, we don't have any plans to continue to ship service packs. So service packs was a design of old that was specifically designed for our on-premises product. Now we're moving towards public updates uh, to where we can release on a monthly basis and deliver value quicker as well as deliver fixes. Um, reliability and performance improvements at a much more rapid cadence. So the way we're doing all that is through our public updates and through our feature packs. So SharePoint Server 2016, if you think about it, we built it not from the ground up, but from the cloud down. So it's a cloud-born, future-proof version of SharePoint. And really what our idea was is let's make SharePoint 2016 vibrant and evolving, something that keeps up with industry trends, something that's not so different from Office 365, it almost appears to be a separate product. And the areas that we wanted to focus on for feature packs was one, the web experience improvements. Some of the investments that you see in Office 365, how can we bring those back? Our developer story was another point of emphasis with feature packs. Hybrid migration improvements, again, being an emphasis of feature packs. But most importantly, we want our customers to know that we're listening uh, as a result of feature packs as well. So we're constantly working our way through user voice, trying to identify 
those things that you want the most and how we can bring that innovation back to you through our feature pack model. So again, feature packs are not something that you go out and download. They're not standalone executables or MSIs. It's basically a moment in time through which we light up features for you as they become ready. So if you look at SharePoint 2016, we released it in March, and then we generated a number of public updates, and then in November, that was our feature pack one moment. The November PU was the public update that lights up those features for you. So for feature pack one, we focused on a number of different things. IT value, uh, so we focused on the OneDrive UX, custom tiles, and administrative action logging, as well as a couple of other things. So in feature pack one, what will you find that we pulled from the cloud? The OneDrive for business UX, as well as custom app launcher tiles. For IT, some enhancements to mineral, so you can build smaller farms, so it reduces the scale of the mineral implementation. Hybrid capabilities, such as auditing and taxonomy, Taxonomy just went generally available. Uh, auditing is still in preview and will become generally available later this year. Administrative action logging, as well as our developer investment, which was the OneDrive API v2. So if you think about the OneDrive for Business Modern UX, what we did is we accrued that from Office 365. So one of the benefits of 2016 and why you should care is that you're getting cloud innovation at a much more rapid cadence and you're getting that innovation based on its success in Office 365. So it's not just a feature that we dream up and deliver without any kind of testing behind it. So with the OneDrive for Business new UX, you get the move and copy to commands, you get the new document information panel, you get rename, and it's fast and responsive. You also get a simple list-based experience for creating your own custom app launcher tiles. So if you want to extend the app launcher and add workloads, that exist either in SharePoint or outside of SharePoint, you can do so through custom tiles. We've also introduced a number of mineral improvements as well to simplify your configuration for smaller farms. So it introduces two new roles to facilitate that. So effectively what it does is it consolidates some of the existing discrete mineral roles and brings them into a new consolidated mineral. So you can think of this as being mini mineral to facilitate the implementation of smaller farms. And you can see those here, the front end with distributed cash and the application with search or the new shared roles. When we first shipped SharePoint 2016, it contained uh, a set of dedicated roles, front end, application, distributed cash or velocity, search, and of course the custom role. And then we had the single server farm role for evaluation, test, and development purposes. But with feature packs, we were able to listen to our customers via user voice and then make a number of investments that we were able to bring back to the server. In this particular case, we heard loud and clear that Mineral resulted in far too large of a server farm environment for our customers. So what we were able to do is invest in bringing that down to enable you to deliver smaller farms through the new shared roles. The other thing I mentioned is part of our feature pack model, we also wanted to bring hybrid migration improvements back to the server as well. So we introduced hybrid auditing, which effectively enables you to leverage both on-premises and Office 365 uh, audit logs from a unified location. So through the Security and Compliance Center in Office 365, when enabling hybrid auditing, you have a unified view into activities that have transpired both against your on-premises environment as well as those that have transpired against content in your Office 365 environment. So that's a great tool, whether you're completely on-premises or you have both on-premises and Office 365. You have this unified view into the audit logging activity. The value here is we collect a lot of data through the audit logs, but we don't really give you great visibility into what that data looks like inside of SharePoint on-premises. By leveraging Office 365 as a vehicle to deliver the reports back to you, we can do a couple of things. We can take that complex audit log data and turn it into something that's human readable, but we can also deliver new reports um, as often as we see necessary to the Security and Compliance Center. Otherwise, if we wanted to deliver those same reports on premises, you would be patching your server all the time to take advantage of the latest reports. So this is a way to get cloud innovation 
that precludes a full-scale migration. You can take advantage of hybrid auditing. And as I mentioned, hybrid taxonomy is now generally available as opposed to preview. And that allows you to maintain a shared taxonomy between on-premises and SharePoint Online. And that was feedback that we got as well. One of the things that blocked a lot of migrations was customers have taken a dependency on metadata. Unfortunately, metadata, while when you create it, it's created using human readable syntax, it's stored as a unique identifier. Because of that, when you migrate documents to Office 365, despite that metadata similarity, the metadata you created in Office 365, even if it has the same human readable name, has a completely different globally unique identifier. In that particular case, even though both documents contain the term test, the test in Office 365 won't resolve to the document itself because the identifiers mismatch. So hybrid taxonomy enables you to have a unified taxonomy experience through which preserved are those globally unique identifiers. So now a document containing the term test in SharePoint on-premises uploaded to Office 365 or migrated to Office 365 will resolve to that same term. So basically you can have your terms, your term sets, and your groups available in both environments. You update your taxonomy in SharePoint Online, that effectively becomes your master, and then those changes are propagated across all of your site collections <coughs> and lists. So there's an example of how you would create uh, the taxonomy experience from a hybrid perspective. And then lastly, administrative action logging. So administrative action logging enables logging of administrative actions that are taken against SharePoint on-premises. And it's almost, it's almost odd to think that over 15 years of delivering SharePoint, we finally recognized the need for auditing administrative actions that were taken by an administrator, be it Windows PowerShell, STS-ADM, or SharePoint Central administration. So that was a capability that was totally based on user voice feedback. And if, you know, that's one of the things I want to emphasize is, as into what's in it for you, is that we take feedback seriously both across Office 365 and our server product, and this was one of those that constantly surfaced itself via user voice and had an exceptional number of votes. So it was something that we invested in through our feature pack model <coughs> and brought back to the server. So I'm just going to switch screens one more time real quick, and we'll take a look at some of these different features. So one of the things I mentioned uh, now that we're looking at our SharePoint 2016 environment again was the concept of custom tiles. So here I am again in SharePoint 2016. I'll click on the waffle or app launcher and I showed you these earlier. We have newsfeed, OneDrive, and sites, all of which are native SharePoint capabilities. But you'll notice I also have this Power Apps tile available to me as well. That Power Apps tile is indicative of what a custom tile looks like. So how did I create the custom tile? I'm just going to go ahead and move over here real quick. So we have a hidden list now that's created as a result of installing Feature Pack 1, and it's available if you just append your root site collection URL with lists and then custom space tiles, and that'll actually take you to the hidden list. You can unhide the list via PowerShell. By default, the list is hidden. Again, just append your URL with lists forward slash custom tiles. It'll take you to the custom tiles list. Via the custom tiles list, as you can see, here's my Power Apps tile. So I'm just going to go ahead and edit this particular tile real quick. So let me just go to edit list. And as you can see, what I've done here is I've given the tile a name, an order, a URL, and then an icon URL. So I can upload a particular icon to facilitate that tile itself. If I wanted to create another tile, I could just specify it here, give it a tile order, and then give it a URL as well as an icon URL. So it's really easy to create custom tiles. It's just a list-based experience, and then you can reorder tiles as needed. You can also use audiences with tiles, and that's the great part about the custom tiles as well. While custom tiles are an interesting concept unto themselves, the ability to target tiles to a specific audience becomes more compelling than the tile itself. So you don't have to inundate your users with dozens of tiles. You can actually target the right set of users with the right 
navigational experience. That's one of the things from Feature Pack 1. I'm just going to go ahead now, move back to my site. So here we are back on our SharePoint 2016 site. The other thing I talked about was user experience. We also brought the new modern OneDrive user experience back to 2016 via the Feature Pack model, another example of cloud accrued innovation. So I can click on OneDrive here, and what you're seeing now is this is my on-prem deployment. You're seeing a fundamentally different OneDrive for business web-based user experience than what was delivered at RTM with SharePoint Server 2016. This one is more indicative of what you see in Office 365 today. So I've got a great set of views available to me. It's modern, it's responsive, it's based on today's web standards, uh, popular JavaScript frameworks, Knockout, React, uh, HTML5, CSS3, so it kind of breaks from the proprietary page model that SharePoint uh, has brought with it through the course of the years. So very quickly, as you can see, I've got my typical list-based experience. Uh, I can view those as tiles. I can click into a folder, select a document, and I can derive more information about that document from my information pane to include a preview of the document itself. So I can see all of the recent activity that, was, that had transpired against that particular document. I can get quick insight into the sharing experience. I can see who it's shared with. If I want to add somebody, I can quickly do so. We're going to go ahead and use Dan again. So I'm just going to select Dan, click Share. One of the things that you'll immediately see is how quickly recent activity picks up on any changes to that particular document. So we're just going to go ahead and refresh the page really quick just to make sure everything's set. Click on the document again, come back to my view, and we're going to find here momentarily that it's going to pick up on that recent activity to show the share. It should already show in my sharing experience. If I want to add people and do it in a different way, we've added get a link. So I can just copy the link and I can send that link. And I can also see very quickly who that document shared with and email those individual users. So we brought that from the cloud back to the server through the feature pack model. The other thing I mentioned is it also brings a lot of the investments that we uh, innovated across in Office 365, such as the move to and copy to commands. So if I wanted to, I could click copy to, quickly create a new folder. I could call this delete me later, click create. Oh, I've exceeded my storage limit, so uh, we'll go ahead and let's see if I can choose a smaller file if I'm lucky. So I'm going to go ahead and click here and copy to new folder. Let's see if it'll let me do it, maybe not. Delete me later. Still don't have the storage to do it. But basically what I can do is I can copy and move folders around. Maybe if I delete archive here. So I've got this folder here. I can actually delete the folder as well as its contents, get rid of it very quickly. And we've got the information pane that pops up here as well. Again, I can move back into my list-based experience. Again, it's mobile, it's responsive, and it's much cleaner. If I wanted to, I could go to the very top level of my uh, OneDrive for Business and see all of the activity across it. So as you can see here, there's the delete activity we just saw when I deleted that archive folder. So very quickly, I can click on a document, and I can see information about it, click on multiple documents, move around, navigate. So the OneDrive for Business experience was one of the other things that we brought back as well. And getting back is very easy because I can just go to my Sites pane, go back to SharePoint 2016, and here I am back at home. So OneDrive for Business, custom tiles, two of the things that we looked at. What else did we invest in? Probably the feature that people wanted most, administrative action logging. And basically, administrative action logging is enabled by default when you install the November PU, aka Feature Pack 1. And what it does is when you navigate to Usage and Health Data Collection, you have a new option here to enable, which is administrative actions. Once administrative actions is enabled, it will create a folder in your logs folder. So that's going to be in your 16 Hive logs called Administrative Actions. If you open up that folder, you can see all of the activity that has transpired against your environment from an administrative perspective. So here we are on February 22nd. If I open that up, we can see different actions that have transpired against my environment already today. So in this particular case, here is an action. Administration Security User Add. 
relatively self-explanatory. Basically, what does that mean? I've added a user. I've changed security. Who did I add? I added Dan Holm. Well, where did I add Dan Holm? I added him at my personal site, OneDrive for Business. And what did I do? I added him to site users. So if you remember when I showed you the OneDrive for Business user experience and how easy it is now to share, I shared a document with Dan. That activity <clears throat> was picked up right away by administrative action logging. Now you're probably asking yourself, why did it pick up that activity? You just shared a document. In my particular case, I'm the farm administrator. So even though I'm performing an information worker action, being the farm administrator, administrative action logging actually captures that activity as well. So it doesn't always have to be those core administrative actions that you're familiar with, such as creating a web application, perhaps deleting a user via central admin or Windows PowerShell. Even those actions I take as an administrator, such as the sharing of information, are captured through administrative action logging. So as you can see here, these logs are all captured. One of the things that happens, though, is over a period of time, they get transitioned from your flat log into the usage DB. So you can query your usage database and get that same information back. So I've already got a query set up. So I'm just going to select the top 1,000. Here's all of my partitions, 0 through 31, indicative of the number of days. I can execute that. And in partition 9, you can see there's some activity. So here was a user ad. And again, this was a Dan Holm ad. And where was Dan Holm added? And on what day? And there it is, 222. It's probably hard to see in the screen. Um, but basically, that action has already been captured. So administrative action logging, again, is one of those exciting pieces of capability that we were able to bring back based on feedback from customers like you via our feature pack model. And all of that comes back to our decision to ship SharePoint 2016 from a converged code base. So that converged code base has a, a paramount importance into the value that we're able to bring back to you through SharePoint Server 2016. So initially, at first glance, when you look at SharePoint 2016 at RTM, you may ask yourself, well, really, really what separates it from SharePoint 2013? One, how we shipped it. And how we shipped it results in the things that we're able to do with it. And a great example of which is the OneDrive experience was a, an exact replica of 2013's when we shipped the product. But now the OneDrive experience is fundamentally different. So when we talked about modern user experiences as we led up to the release of SharePoint 2016, we had in mind this feature pack model through which we could do so. And OneDrive was our first starting point, enabling us to bring that back to you. So there's OneDrive for business again, very easy to use, very fluid, and a nice, clean, and fast design. So again, I can come in and I can perform those common actions right here from the menu, getting a link, inviting people, or looking at the sharing activity. And I still have the advanced sharing menu available to me as well. So if I click on advanced share, as you can see, it takes you to that ribbon-based familiar experience from SharePoint 2013. But again, it abstracts a lot of the complexity in favor of making it easy to work with. So now moving back to the slides, there's that third thing that really separates SharePoint 2016 from SharePoint 2013. And that's the ability to take advantage of Office 365. So if you think about it, you got cloud innovation natively with SharePoint 2016 when we shipped the product as a result of us shipping it from a converged code base. Simple controls, app launcher, large file support, simple sharing experience, um, and a number of uh, the mobile touch web UX, the mineral investments, so the infrastructure side, a lot of native things came as a product of us shipping from a converged code base. Then more cloud innovation came as a result of us shipping feature packs enabled through the converged code base. And now lastly, for the best experience, you can also take advantage of native hybrid capabilities that we baked into the product and that we delivered from Office 365. So you can fast track your move to Office 365 through SharePoint 2016. And you can do that one in two ways. One, most people choose hybrid for the flexibility. 
because they have a significant investment in customization, either self-developed or purchased through an ISV that doesn't have an equivalent in Office 365 or doesn't fit within the model of the app model or the SharePoint framework. Perhaps this is, it's a significant footprint, so you have a significant investment in network and hardware in order to facilitate your deployment. You have a deployment that exists in remote locations to satisfy data sensitivity or sovereignty needs or residency needs. There may be corporate or regulatory reasons you want to remain partially on premises. Or lastly, you may have manageability concerns. Um, there are certain things that you do with the product that SharePoint Online doesn't allow you to do because they're more infrastructure or, or farm level configurations. So there's kind of two ways that you can take advantage of some of the hybrid capabilities we've delivered. One, you can use it as a bridge during migration. So as a migration process, as opposed to creating two discrete data silos, you can actually connect those two silos via hybrid in order to facilitate a smoother migration. That allows you to migrate at your own pace. You don't have to try to turn migration into a weekend activity. You can also use it to pilot some services with a subset of your users. Perhaps you want to provide to a subset of your users the ability to store, share, and sync information across any device anywhere, a la OneDrive for Business and Office 365. Or you want to enable a subset of your organization to leverage external sites in Office 365. You can do so via hybrid. The other thing you can do is just maintain a hybrid model. Perhaps there's hybrid capability that's compelling to you, but you don't want to migrate all of your investment to Office 365. You don't want it to be a lift and shift operation. You want to maximize ROI on your existing investments. And the way that you can do that is through maintaining a hybrid model. So the two models are basically migration to the cloud is bringing your business to the cloud. Maintaining a hybrid model is bringing the cloud back to your business. So taking advantage of capabilities such as Delve and the Office Graph, that precludes a wholesale migration. And by that, you can index your content on premises and store the index in Office 365 and then take advantage of views via Delve and take advantage of the mobile applications um, that the Office Graph and Delve provide. So it provides opportunity for you to take advantage of cloud innovation that precludes a wholesale data migration. The other one that fits within that category is hybrid auditing. The ability for you to send audit data to Office 365 and then rationalize that through the Security and Compliance Center, but doing so in a way that doesn't require migration of your data. You can simply maintain that hybrid model. So there's a landscape of capabilities we deliver through hybrid with SharePoint 2016. And it all starts with the app launcher. So for app discovery, we introduced the app launcher. We derived that directly from Office 365, directly from SharePoint Online. It's a way for you to discover workloads and applications that exist both on-premises and in Office 365, as well as create your own custom tiles. Well, what apps can you discover via the app launcher in a hybrid scenario? OneDrive for Business, Yammer, Sites, Office 365 Video, and Delve can all be incorporated via hybrid into the app launcher itself. And then lastly, you have what we call data discovery. So we've moved from app discovery and apps down to data discovery. And that's finding information, whether that's taxonomy, auditing, or search. Those are the three data discovery layer investments that SharePoint 2016 offers natively. So I'm going to go ahead real quick and move back to a browser. So let me just kind of move back. I'm going to go ahead and move into a separate window. And we'll navigate to another on-premises environment that's configured for hybrid. So the one I showed you a moment, a moment ago with all the other capabilities was a native 2016 environment with no affinity to Office 365. This environment we're looking at now is an environment that's connected to Office 365 via hybrid. So here's SharePoint 2016, again, on-premises. But if you look at the app launcher now, it looks fundamentally different than the app launcher on-premises did. I still have sites in OneDrive, but I also have Yammer, Delve, and Office 365 video. And that's because this particular environment is configured for hybrid. So in this case, when I click on sites, as opposed to taking me to my on-premises sites page, it's navigating me 
to Office 365. So I'm just going to go ahead and authenticate again since I'm using same sign-on, not single sign-on for this environment, meaning I'm just using Azure AD Sync as opposed to ADFS. So now what we're doing is we're logging into my Office 365 tenancy to view the sites page. And what I'm going to have as soon as I'm authenticated is an aggregate view of site membership across both on-premises and Office 365. So as you can see, I have on-premises sites. If I click on that, it'll take me back to my on-prem deployment. And I have cloud sites. So again, clicking on sites in a hybrid scenario takes me to the cloud to where I have an aggregate view. I clicked on Contoso, which took me to on-prem. I could also click on SharePoint Online, which will take me to Office 365. So as you can see up here in the App Launcher, I'm now in Office 365. So it allows me an easy way to navigate back and forth between on-premises and Office 365 through a hybrid sites experience. I can also, through the App Launcher, navigate to Delve. And if I want to search Delve, I can search for a term such as marketing. And I have a number of different marketing documents uh, that are pulling up. So I'm just going to go ahead and say see all results. And as you can see, there's a number of different marketing documents that have been discovered via Delve. So I have got documents that exist in Office 365 as well as documents from my on-premises deployment. So just scrolling to the top, let's just go ahead and do another quick search. So instead of searching for marketing, let's search for SharePoint. And now searching for SharePoint, I'm going to get results back from both Office 365 as well as SharePoint on-premises. And how do I know where they're coming from? Well, I know because if it's an on-premises document, it won't have a thumbnail associated with it. So sales and marketing here should navigate me back to on-prem when I click on it. And as you can tell by the URL, I'm back on-premises, SharePoint, as opposed to Office 365. I knew I was going to on-premises because it doesn't have the telltale uh, thumbnail associated with it. Whereas, whereas if I click on this document, it'll actually take me to the cloud, as you denoted by that PowerPoint icon. And here I am, PowerPoint Online, look at the URL, it's Office 365. So Delve is one of those easy experiences you can get. And you can also bring experiences back, again, to on-premises. So if I navigate back to my sites page, and in this case, I'm going to use the new SharePoint Home. So here I am in my new SharePoint Home. I have a featured link for on-premises. I can click on that. It takes me back to on-prem. You'll notice over here I can bring video from Office 365 video into my on-premises deployment. So this is a way to just take advantage of cloud capability. I can go to HR or Sales and Marketing where I can introduce uh, Yammer as, as a conversational pane. So as you can see here, I've got a Yammer conversation that is loading as well as a video from Office 365 video. And then if I want to share externally, I can also use my partner portal. So as opposed to standing up a complex intranet in Office 365, I can actually create a partner portal, or I mean creating a complex intra extranet um, on premises, I can just simply use external sharing and external sites in Office 365 in order to facilitate my extranet needs. So that's going to be popping up here momentarily on the screen. So basically my extranet is now in Office 365, but it has an affinity to on-premises because I can navigate back and forth very easily and again take advantage of cloud capability as well as their associated mobile app. So that was just kind of a very quick view of hybrid in the waning moments of today's webinar. So if you think about the value of SharePoint 2016 and what it means to you, again it all starts with that fundamental decision to ship from a converged code base. It allows you to take advantage of Office 365 innovation at a much more rapid cadence than on-prem traditionally provided. It also enables you to ease the migration to Office 365 for those of you who would like to be there in the future. So to think about it, it's A, it's a foundational release. Foundational in that it establishes a foundation for future innovation. Built for continuous innovation. Again, it was born in the cloud and we delivered it on premises. That's a nod to the converged code base aspect. And then because it was built in the cloud, probably one of the most important things to take away from that is that SharePoint 2016 represents the most comprehensively tested version of SharePoint 
we've ever shipped. Why? Because it's been tested for scale and it's been tested for resiliency as a result of running it at scale in Office 365 as SharePoint Online. Because we took basically SharePoint Online or a point in time snapshot thereof and delivered it on premises, that means it's been validated over the course of time by the hundreds of millions of SharePoint Online users and we've been able to address the bugs, apply the security fixes, address resiliency, address reliability, address scalability, and then deliver it right back to you. So it's comprehensively tested as a result of running in the cloud. So just kind of in review, we launched SharePoint 2016 at RTM in March of 2016, generally available in May of 2016. We've introduced a number of different public updates <coughs> since then. We introduced SharePoint Server 2016 in Azure. So through the gallery, you can quickly provision 2016 images in Azure. And then as we move through the course of 2016, we'll be uh, working on another feature pack um, for SharePoint 2016. So SharePoint 2016 feature pack one is also the November PU. And then we have plans moving forward um, throughout the course of 2017 to start reviewing an opportunity for feature pack two. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over and pause the presentation for a moment. And that gives us about 15 minutes to do uh, Q&A. We do have have uh, some great folks from Microsoft available as well. Um, Bob Fox joined us today, and it looks like he may have been answering a number of different questions and helping out via chat. So I'm going to go ahead and pause here and see uh, what questions we can get answered. Sounds good. Thanks a lot so far, Bill. I pre really appreciate the information. And you're right, Bob Fox was here. He actually recently, I believe, left. Um, or is leaving right now because he has another meeting. But he was really helpful in answering a bunch of questions. So appreciate that, Bob, if you're still there. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, a question here. It's things that have not been answered. So let's see. Uh, one other thing that caught me over here was a question by, I believe, Stephen. Um, the new share, this is early on in the webinar. So it's talking about the new share option no longer needs the manage permission permission is that true um, you know it doesn't basically what it does is is from a simple sharing experience um, or, or what we call simple sharing in SharePoint 2016 as well as in office 365 the underlying technology that um, exists behind the sharing experiences is fundamentally unchanged if you think about the way that you've shared in the past, you used to choose from the ribbon um, the, the share gesture. And from that gesture, you had a number of different options available to you. You had restricted, you had view only. Um, so there was a number of different sharing levels or, or permission sets available to a given document or, or a given piece of content in SharePoint. And basically what simple sharing does is it leverages the underlying sharing infrastructure that existed in SharePoint 2013. It just provides an abstraction layer to the complexity of finding the right share option. And that's the only really big thing that's changed um, from a sharing perspective with 2016. Uh, the other thing that's changed as well is is the sharing gesture itself, um, the, the capture of that sharing gesture isn't search-based anymore, it's cache-based. So we use the distributed cache in an effort to collect information about the sharing activity. And that's why you could see the share gesture show up so quickly as part of the information pane in administrative action logging, because that gesture doesn't take a dependency on search anymore. So kind of coming back to the core of the question, um, Managed permissions is still there. It's under advanced. Um, it's under advanced. The only thing that's changed is we've just provided a simple abstraction layer to the sharing gesture itself, enabling you to just quickly click share and choose view or edit or get a link. And that's really the only thing that's changed. If you click advanced, you your destination becomes the old sharing page um, with all the complexity that comes along with it. Sounds good. Here's a question by um, Christian, I believe. I haven't seen a column to set the size of the custom tile in the hidden list. Is there a setting to do that? 
So for, uh, for custom tiles, um, there isn't a setting to date that allows you to instrument the size of the tile itself. Um, basically what you have available to you from, from a custom tile perspective is you can create the, tusk, the custom tile, you can order the custom tile um, in a way that makes sense to your organization. So it could be the first tile, it could be the last tile or somewhere in between. And you can set an icon for that tile. But we don't give you a native way through the custom tiles list in, in order to instrument the size, color, or other options related to that tile itself. Okay, makes sense. All right, a bunch of questions just came in also, so uh, let me go down the line. Um, Todd is asking, when working with a hybrid configuration, is there a way to streamline the login? We have users, especially at the C level, that resist any solution that requires multiple logins. Sure, that's actually a that's actually a really good question. Um, let me just give you a quick example here as I, as I answer that question. I might just go back to um, screen sharing sure, very briefly. Let me just sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words uh, when you when you think about the auth scenario or the auth experience when it comes to hybrid. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and show my screen, and uh, with any luck, you should be looking at I my SharePoint 2016 site. Yeah, there you go. It was go to webinar blocking it before, unfortunately. Now it's fine. Yep. Perfect. And I think I think the question is is regarding multiple logins or auth prompts. So here here we are again on premises in my on premises environment configured for hybrid. Now what happens is when I want to go to OneDrive because I'm configured for hybrid, it's going to want to take me to Office 365. Now we're seeing an additional login prompt to authenticate against the Office 365 service, and I'll explain why here in a moment. Now I've authenticated against Office 365. That is the multiple login prompt scenario. The reason is, in this particular case, is because what I have implemented is called same sign-on. Basically what same sign-on is, is I can use the same credentials that are assigned to me from my on-premises identity provider to authenticate against Office 365. However, I'm prompted to authenticate when I transition from on-premises to Office 365. The reason is, is because there is no affinity between my directory service and Azure AD other than the fact that I've configured Azure AD Sync or in the old world, we used to call it DirSync. So basically, what I'm doing is synchronizing username and password hash between on-premises and Office 365, resulting in a same sign-on experience. Now, in order to reduce the, the auth challenge that you're speaking of, where, where your C-level um, stakeholders don't want to have multiple authentication prompts, as opposed to configuring same sign-on, you want to configure federation, so ADFS. What ADFS gives you is here we are on premises again. Now assume that I have ADFS configured in this use case versus same sign-on. I'm going to perform the same action. I'm going to click on the app launcher. I'm going to click on OneDrive, and it should seamlessly bring me to Office 365. Now, what was different in this particular example? Well, in this example, I've already pre-authed because I've authenticated against Office 365 once before, but let's just ignore that and pretend that this was single sign-on or SSO. The reason it would work this way is because of ADFS, because of federation. So if you're using single sign-on, I can authenticate against on-premises and then transition to cloud without being prompted for username and password. So it's seamless authentication across both my on-prem and cloud investments in the case to where I've configured ADFS. In cases where I haven't configured ADFS and I'm only using same sign-on, uh, DirSync or Azure AD Sync, then I'll get multiple um, login prompts. So really for your particular use case, if, if those C-level executives don't like the aspect of having to re-auth to the cloud, then you want to implement a single sign-on versus a same sign-on solution. Okay. Here's the next one. 
So this person is asking, um, so I can have mixed user profile properties from on-premises and online, and also uh, LOB on-prem systems? Yes, you sure can. So the way that that would work is um, there's a number of different ways that you can that, that you can um, surface line of business data in Office 365. Uh, one of those ways is you could leverage a hybrid business connectivity services or BCS scenario in Office 365. And effectively what that allows you to do is configure BCS in Office 365 and then connect it back to an on-premises line of business system, which it, one of the requirements is that it's OData capable. If it's not OData capable, you have to build an OData service head as an intermediary between the line of business application on-premises and Office 365, and effectively that's just a proxy. It's a web service um, that, that uh, if enables OData so BCS can read it. Now, from a user profile perspective, uh, let's say you have custom attributes associated with the user that are derived from a line of business application. So maybe 40% of your user profile is derived from your identity provider, 80. The other 60% um, may be derived from, say, Siebel or PeopleSoft or JD Edwards or some other line of business application. In that scenario, the best way to bring the custom attributes to Office 365 is through the user profile bulk import API. So if you search for bulk import API user profile uh, via Bing, Google, whatever you may use, um, it's going to take you to GitHub. Uh, via GitHub, you can actually download a, a running uh, version of this utility that allows you to specify all of the custom attributes you want to add per user in a, uh, in, in a spreadsheet view, so CSV, and then import those into the user profile service in Office 365. So 365 basically won't connect directly back to your line of business application and supplement your user profiles, you actually have to feed those custom attributes to the user profile service in the cloud using the bulk import API. Another way you can discover it is if you visit hybrid.office.com from the very top navigation, select downloads, and from downloads there's a link to where you can get the, uh, the bulk import service that will allow you to bring those custom attributes to Office 365. All right. Here's the next one. Um, what resources exist for best practices, uh, for example, installation? And is PowerShell still the best practice install method? That's a question by Matthew. So from a resources perspective, um, everything from a best practices um, perspective is going to be documented on TechNet under the SharePoint 2016 node um, in the TechNet library. So if you, if you navigate to technet.microsoft.com forward slash SharePoint, it'll take you to the top level SharePoint node. You can select SharePoint 2016, and all of our documentation um, is going to reside there for best practices. Now, the benefit of 2016 is the other thing that's what's in it for you, since that's the, the uh, intent of this webinar, is that 2016, because it's derived from the cloud, means that everything that we've learned about running SharePoint at scale is natively included in 2016. To give you a great example of which is the whole reason we came up with this mineral concept is because of our experience running SharePoint at scale. In the past on TechNet, we used to have best practices articles that discussed how to best um, formulate your topology. Um, so it was an installation scenario document, which is this is what a web server should look like, this is what an app server should look like, and we instructed you to provision a specific set of services on each of those servers. With Minroll, what we've done is not only have we taken that work away in that you don't have to read a document to figure out which services should go on which server, but we've also optimized each role. So like the web role, not only is it pre-configured with all of the services that would facilitate it being a web server, all of the code paths are optimized for high performance. All of the application server role code paths are optimized for high throughput. So from a best practices perspective, there's kind of two ways. Is one, um, there's the guidance on TechNet, 
another place that I would recommend is, is Microsoft Virtual Academy. There's free five to ten minute videos that dive into each of these topics there around SharePoint 2016 performance optimization and deployment and upgrade. Definitely recommend looking at Microsoft Virtual Academy. And then lastly, the big benefit is that we've been able to natively bake best practices directly into the server um, as a result of our experience running SharePoint at scale. Great. All good resources. All right, here's another question. This is, of course, a big one on many people's mind usually <laughs> we're talking about SharePoint. How about the list threshold limit view in SharePoint 2016 for large list? Do we have uh, some upgrade limitations? Uh, so for list for list view threshold, we've we've done a number of micro improvements to to facilitate a better um, list view threshold. One of those is a concept that we call auto indexing. So if you think about SharePoint um, lists. Basically, when you're creating a list, you're creating a table. Um, so, you know, it's almost as if SharePoint's this abstraction layer to SQL. But when a user creates a list, they're creating a table. When they create a table, they're creating rows and columns. Of course, when a table reaches a, a certain size and depth, then it needs to be optimized. And the traditional way of, of you know, uh, uh, say any, any, user, any user database in SQL that contains some tables, is a DBA would create an index on, on a column somewhere. And that would optimize that particular table for its depth and scope. Um, unfortunately, through SharePoint, you're not a DBA. You're an end user, and you're creating a list. You don't recognize that that list is actually the equivalent of a table. We used to give you this option to create an index. We still have it, um, but it's abstracted. But what that option did is it was really meaningless to the end user themselves. The end user would ask, okay, well, what is, what is an index? So they would create an index just somewhere um, because we gave them the option to do so. SharePoint 2016 features auto-indexing. So when we determine or the system determines that a view is reaching a particular threshold, 2,500 items, we automatically and programmatically create an index um, for that particular view on the appropriate column. So we do a lot of programmatic things to keep people um, from, from reducing their own performance um, when it comes to large lists. The other problem that we had with large lists in the past was row locks escalating into table locks. So from, from a SQL perspective, because again, all you're creating is a table, when that table reached 5,000 items, the row locks would escalate into a table lock. Uh, when a table locks, that means anybody in that content DB is going to be affected by that lock. So that's what we used to call lock escalation. We've resolved lock escalation in 2016, so that no longer exists. So once you exceed 5,000 from a view threshold perspective, you're not escalating row locks to table locks anymore. So there's two, two things initially. Uh, one is the indexing experience is now programmatic and system managed. Two, row locks and table locks or, or this concept of lock escalation no longer exists. And then number three, from a guidance perspective, if you view TechNet, it says that the list view threshold in 2016 is now greater than 5,000. It used to say 5,000. So, you know, the answer you're probably looking for is what exactly is the threshold? Give me an int that tells me what that threshold is. And honestly, that's, that's a number we ourselves don't know. Um, because we throttle SPO and we don't have insight into how you're using lists. So we don't know exactly when that threshold will kick in because it's going to vary by environment. It's going to vary by table width and depth. But it is, it's greater than 5,000, but that exact finite number you're looking for, um, that's something we don't have documented because it hasn't been tested up to a specific limit that's consistent yet. I wish I could give you a better answer than that. It was a it was a really long answer to probably what was expected to be, you know, a really short question and answer. But it was really good detail. I enjoyed it personally. This is a question that's been asked of me as a trainer for such a long time, and I'm so glad with that auto-indexing. You know, that's just going to make it super simple. It, it's got to be super simple for it to work, for it to be successful, and I think it's going to help quite a bit. So thank you very much for that. 
All right, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, your time, Bill, uh, and everybody else's time out there as well. So I know we're a couple minutes already over. You guys, uh, you saw Bill share his Twitter address in the beginning also, and, I, um, yep. uh, and other information too, I'm sure you can find Bill easily online. So let him know. Uh, let us know also if we can help at Visual SP. If you enjoy the webinar, let us know. If you can make things improve, let us know. Uh, sorry about some of that issue, by the way, with the GoToWebinar screen blocking on the screen. I apologize for that. Uh, some bug it looks like. We'll put the recording up pretty soon. You'll get a link to the recording within a few hours uh, and we'll go from there. A survey is going to come up also right after you leave or when you're leaving. If you could fill out that survey let us know how we can improve and what we have done right. That always helps us and also motivates us to do more of these as well. So once again thanks very much everybody and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. And thanks Bill for spending so so much good information, good good time and you know uh, you know giving that information to everybody. I learned a lot myself as well. I'm sure a lot of people are going to say the same thing in the comments. So thanks a lot. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks folks. Talk to you next time.